I hope you all are doing well. Um, welcome to the John F. Kennedy Jr. Forum at the Institute of Politics. Uh, my name is Ryan Tierney. I'm a sophomore at the college studying history and literature, and I'm the director of community partnerships here at the JFK Jr. Forum Committee. Before we begin, please note the exit doors, which are located both by the park over there and by JFK Street over there. In the event of an emergency, walk to the exit closest to you and congregate in the JFK Park. Please also take a moment now to silence your cell phones so we can prepare for tonight's forum. And now, take your seats and join me in a round of applause for my friend and our Institute of Politics co-director of special projects, Luis Fernando Esteva Suero. Hello, everybody. Uh, on behalf of the Institute of Politics and the JFK Junior Forum, I'd like to welcome you all uh, for, for joining us tonight. I'd like to thank you all for joining us tonight. Apologies. Um, my name is Luis Estevasuedo, as he said. I'm a sophomore in Dunster House and one of the IOP's directors of special projects. Uh, tonight, I have the distinct honor of introducing specialist uh, Shoshana Nairi Johnson, retired, uh, a veteran of Operation Iraqi Freedom, and the first African-American woman to be taken as a prisoner of war in the history of the American military. She was born into a military family in Pedro Miguel, Panama, and moved back to the United States as a child, where she would participate in her high school's JROTC program uh, and later enlist in the United States Army. In February of 2003, she deployed in support of Operation Iraqi Freedom, where her convoy was ambushed one month in, and she was taken captive for 22 days. Since her return to the States, she has received numerous awards for her distinguished service, including the Bronze Star, and is the author of national bestseller, I'm Still Standing, From Captive U.S. Soldier to Free Citizen, My Journey Home. Tonight, she will be speaking in conversation with the Executive Director of the IOP and Naval Intelligence Specialist and Iraq War Veteran, Seti Warren. Without further ado, ladies and gentlemen, Specialist Shoshana Johnson retired and Seti Warren. Good evening, everyone, and welcome to this really special, important conversation uh, this evening. This conversation is a part of an initiative that was started back in September, the Veterans Impact Initiative. It seeks to bridge the military and civilian divide. I always tell people, my people, when I returned home from Iraq in 2008, many people would approach me and say, thank you for your service. And I'd always wish I could share with them what it was really like to be in a combat war zone and reintegrate, in, reintegrate into society. That's what this initiative seeks to do, to inform future public policymakers, many of whom are at the Kennedy School and at the college, what it really is like to be on the front lines in dangerous war zones around the world. Tonight we have a really special opportunity to hear from a war hero who happens to be black and a woman. For, o for many centuries, in fact, since the inception of the United States, blacks have served in every conflict and major war since the beginning. And many times, blacks returned home from those wars and were treated unequally. It makes for a unique experience. So I'd like to get started, Shoshana. It is so great to be with you. Thank you so much for being here. Thank you for having me. I, um, I'd like for you to share your story. And in particular, as you do, a little bit of your background. I'd love for you to share why you decided to join the armed forces. Raise your right hand, put that uniform on. Well, um, I am an immigrant to the United States. Uh, when my father uh, came to the United States, he joined the military to support his family. Uh, he left Panama and he left the excellent job, he was a fireman for 11 years and started over so my sisters and myself can dream big and accomplish. So I saw my father being in the military, uh, uncles, my aunts, and um, 
It sparked my interest. I joined JRRTC and I loved it. I really loved the idea of the structure of the military. I wanted to go directly after high school, but you know, my parents were on me. They said, you know, they made a sacrifice so I can continue education and dream big. So they didn't have anything against the military is how they, you know, move forward in this country. So, did the mic drop? <laughs> um, but they told me, if you're going to go in the military, get your education first, go in as an officer. Um, I went to college, messed around, uh, had a really good time, I partied hard. <laughs> um, my parents were very strict uh, uh, when I was younger. I dropped out, I really didn't have a purpose. I figured out what I wanted to do with culinary. They said, you need to find a way to pay for it because we put you through the first time and you messed up. And I, you know, my sisters were behind me and um, I looked to the military. It was what that first interest in the first place. It was a way for pay for college. And my sister was actually um, graduating from a military school and um, getting commissioned as an officer in the army. So that was the thing for me, but you know, for you to be a military person, it has to be something that's ingrained in you. It's not for the average person. I think sometimes in our society, people think, well, I can do that. You're looking on the outside. You don't know the actual, uh, uh, what it's like to put on that uniform and being away from family and all the things that goes into protecting this nation. So it has to be a calling. And I, for me, it was a calling. Uh, you know, I, don't regret being in the military one day. I loved it. I'm glad I'm retired now because I'm getting too old for that. But um, I loved it and I would do it again and again and again. It was something I'm proud that I did. It gave me a sense of purpose and it helped me, uh, you know, streamline things a little bit. Sometimes I could be a little, well, I could be a lot wishy-washy, a lot. Um, and I think sometimes I followed too much and I think the military helped me to lead more and stand some back, sometimes stand back and follow if you don't know where you're going. Sometimes you have to take a, a step back and follow a little bit until you learn and then you can lead, so. I appreciate a number of things you just said. I remember when I enlisted in uh, 2003 and raised my right hand and put that uniform on, I fully knew I could end up anywhere in the war in, in multiple situations. Uh, so with that, how did you actually end up in Iraq? And, and tell us what happened when you were there. Well, you know, the beginning of that conflict is just strange. We all know it. Looking back, you know, you couldn't see the clear cut lines, but I was a soldier. It wasn't, you know, we have that saying, mine is not to question my why, mine is to do or die. So we get orders, you get, put your gear together and you go. I had a two year old daughter at the time, but I also had parents who had my back, aunts, uncles, cousins, military, they knew what was going on. It was, re really, we didn't think anything of it. I'm going for six months, I'll be back soon, it's no big deal. Because my dad did the Gulf War, so did my uncle, my aunt. And at the time I was deploying, one of my cousins was deploying also. I didn't know that at the time. So we get in country, you know, we don't know what's going on until, what, 30 days or so into it, that we get orders, we're gonna go cross the berm meaning we're gonna cross the border from Kuwait into Iraq. I'm not gonna lie, I questioned it. I questioned, I was like, I didn't understand why we were going given what our unit's job was. We were a maintenance unit, we supported Patriot units, and Patriots need to be so far back in order to fire the missiles that take down. So I didn't understand why we were so eager to cross the berm, but I was a specialist and a cook. I don't you know, question the commander or the battalion commander and so forth. Uh, three days into the conflict, we went into a city before it was secure because we had fallen so back, far behind the uh, main convoy and we were ambushed. 
we lost nine members of my unit, two other members that were attached, and five of us became, well, six of us became prisoners of war. Uh, Joseph Hudson was captured first, Patrick Miller, Jim Riley, Edgar Hernandez, and then myself. When the Iraqis were going back, checking the bodies, they found out that uh, Jessica Lynch and Lorianne Piastawa were alive after our RPG had hit their vehicle. They were taken to the hospital. Lorianne Piastawa passed away from her injuries. And um, Jessica was kept at that hospital while me and the guys were moved to Baghdad, interrogated and uh, held in a prison. Two pi pilots were shot down that same day and joined us in captivity. So it was me and six guys that were in captivity for 22 days until the Marine Corps came to the rescue. How did you get through that experience? I mean, what that just describing it the way you did, I mean, how did you get through that? Um, I did a lot of praying. Uh, I had I had walked away from faith a little bit, and then I remember I had a bad, bad breakup in 2002. And, you know, I started going back to church and things like that, I, and I went to different denominations, but then in the end, I ended up going back to my, um, the faith of my mother and my grandmother, I'm a Catholic. And I remember asking for my rosary when I was deploying. And I forgot it at home and I asked my mom to send it. So during my captivity, I did a lot of praying. I apologized to God for everything, every bad thing I ever did, <laughs> from teasing my sisters, to lying to my parents, to going partying too much. I apologized for everything. Um, I thought of my daughter a lot. I, I knew I didn't have to worry about her. I knew my parents had it, my family had it, but I wanted to see her grow, um, graduate high school, graduate college, live her life to the best of her ability. Um, I've been blessed to be able to see some of that. She graduated high school. Uh, she graduated with an associate's degree. She's working on her bachelor's degree. You know, she's still getting on my nerves, but. <laughs> um, I, I'm very blessed, but I, like I said, I relied on my faith, and then I had six guys that were there to support me. You know, when, when we could, we gave words of support to each other. If I was completely alone, I don't know if I would have been able to make it. I, um, I think I've been blessed enough to meet POWs from World War II, Korea, Vietnam, Desert Storm, and they all endured captivity longer than me. I don't know how they manage to keep themselves sane and come home. And then they come home and become advocates in a big way for the next generation, right. you know? Yeah, and I, you know, I was, I was really taken by, you were injured quite seriously during that time. And I, I was taken by the, the fact that you were able to, to just get through that um, with the injuries that you sustained. Yeah. In both legs, um, tore through the Achilles in the right leg, uh, fractured a bone in the right. Um, you do what you gotta do. You don't know how strong you are until you have to do it. You know, uh, I remember as a young adult, you watch those old Lifetime movies and TV of the mo week movies about, you know, women enduring you know, uh, domestic abuse and all that kinds of stuff. And I always used to watch them and say, wow, if something like that happened to me, I would just have a heart attack and die. I would never be able to survive it. Those women are so strong. The ambush happened and I waited for my heart attack. The heart attack didn't happen, so I had to, I had to get up and keep go trucking. I had to do what I had to do to survive as best as I could. Um, I remember that first day in captivity it was a long day, they interrogated us and all that kind of stuff. They were taking us to the prison. I hadn't been able to walk because the pain was so bad. When they were taking us to the prison, I walked because I was terrified that if I was too much of a burden, they, they would just shoot me and just not deal with me if, I, if they had to carry me. 
Now, thinking back when I was a younger woman, I would have never thought I'd be able to walk on a broken bone or tore Achilles, but when the time came and you have to do it for your survival, you can do it. And hopefully, the younger generation, by me saying it enough, will catch on. You are stronger than you think you are. I was moved as you described your rescue and then your communication with your family for the first time. Tell us a little bit about what it's like, first of all, returning home um, and facing some of the challenges of re-entering society after, after this horrific experience that you had. Well, first I have to give credit to the Marine Corps. I, w I wouldn't have been here, I wouldn't be here right this moment um, getting to enjoy my life if they hadn't taken a chance and put themselves in danger. They moved on a tip that was unverified and they risked their lives for me and my fellow POWs to come home and I'm grateful. I'm still in contact with quite a few of them. Um, but you know, people are under the impression that the physical injuries heal, you come home, you see your family and that's the end of it and it's not, it's not that easy at all. You know, you deal with the weight of the fact that people you knew so well, that you slept with, you ate with, you showered with, are gone, and there was nothing you can do. And the fact that, you, that guilt, that weighs on you, why me, why not them, you know, and stuff like that. And then you put the media attention on, a, on top of that. And it, is, it can be very difficult. I am very lucky, and I always say it, and I keep saying it, I have a wonderful family. They drive me crazy. But I have a wonderful family. Their military experience was there, and just the nature of who they are was there to support me. I still struggle a lot with my mental health. Um, I'm not ashamed of it. I went through something, and... Um, it weighs on me, but thank goodness for, for my family, you know, um, and they keep it real, and they keep me humble, <laughs> you know. I get, I've been able to do a lot of things, you know, and wonderful things. Meet the president, I got to meet the president of my native country, Panama, invited back home for a state dinner. I've been uh, able to meet uh, the president of this nation, George W. Bush, at a correspondence dinner. Um, but in the end, I go back home. That first year, I lived with my parents because I was unable to you know, live on my own, especially take care of my daughter. I would come back home from these trips and my mother would be like, that's wonderful, that's nice. You need to wash them dishes and clean that kitchen. <laughs> she goes, you stay in here, you ain't staying for free. Go on and take, clean that up and clean that up and stuff like that. So that keeps it real. Yeah. You, I'm not getting a big head at all with my family. They'll keep me down to earth. But um, the struggle is real, you know, the struggle is real. And uh, even with a wonderful family, even getting all the uh, uh, mental health care that I get, being a pr pr former prisoner of war and a Purple Heart recipient with the VA, I get pushed to the top if I have a crisis and stuff like that. And I still have been hospitalized three times since being home. So if that happens to me, what is it like for the average veteran after they've done two tours, three tours, four tours, that they don't have a huge military family, that they don't get pushed to the top because they were a prisoner of war? We've got to do better. I, I definitely want to come back to that because that's an important go forward question for us. Um, you, you wrote quite extensively about your relationship with Jessica Lynch. Yes. And you wrote quite extensively about how the media treated her, or ent even entertainment, um, treated her and then how you were treated. So this, I would love for you to, because I think, I think this is an important part of the story. Please, please share you know, your, your accounts of that relationship and what you experienced there. You know, um I th they make a big deal out of nothing. 
And they, they, it became this, let's pit them against each other. There is no, she and I are the only ones, the only females surviving that conflict as prisoners of war. There are times when I can only talk to her and she can only talk to me. You know, they made a big hype, you know, and, and they did all these things, uh, you know, People Magazine and all that kind of stuff. She was still in the hospital. She had no input in a lot of these things. And yeah. we're black, so go ahead. I'm sorry. Yeah. She got a lot of coverage when she uh, when she appealed to and, the hospital. Uh, so she she had a not she didn't have a, any input. Right. Jessica stayed in the hospital up until like August of that year, and she was still uh, in the military. So that, you know, there's lots of things you couldn't do and stuff like that. So they took it upon themselves to do a lot of this hype and stuff like that and, and this versus that. It was unnecessary, and but, you know, she and I didn't take it to heart as far as who we are. You know, I still remember little Jessica, she's significant, she's like 10, 11 years younger than me. Um, when we deployed and she wouldn't eat, you know, she hated the MREs and stuff like that. And, um, you know, her, her glasses, her new glasses prescription didn't come back in time. So I'd be like, you're blind as a bat, ain't you? <laughs> um, and stuff like that. So our relationship is great. I know I can call her if, you know, if something comes up and she can call me. Um, I think we have a problem where we have to pit two women against each other instead of letting each one stand on their own two feet. And it happens all the time. And then, God forbid, they happen to be black and white. Then it hypes up even more, where it has to be one or the other. How about the both of us? How about not talk, let's talk about Pi. Pi Esther was the first Native American woman to die in combat, well, die from her injuries, because she's the first Native American woman POW. Yet, they forget that Pi was there and gave her life. So uh, we, we need to do a little bit better with that. And I know sometimes we think, well, that's the media. It is also us because we dictate what they put out by what we consume. How many times you click on this and click on that is tracked. So if we continue to click on the salacious stuff continuously, they're gonna continue to put it out there because that's what's giving them that viewership. If you turn your back towards the salacious and go towards something else, then that will dictate what is shown to us. So don't just say, oh, that's them and how they do it. It's also you and what you consume. Certain shows get turned off the air if nobody's watching it. You, we have to take some responsibility for that. That's a, that's a great point. Do you think, just staying on that line, that when you think about returning v veterans and the images that we see on screen um, and the news and the like, do you think things have improved in this regard or do you think they remain the same? I, I, it's hard, that's a difficult one. I think they show more, but once again, they go to, for the salacious, you know, um, most, they want to grab the biggest impact and most gut-wrenching. And it has a negative effect from a lot of us that are home. Because as we try to heal, this thing is being thrown in our face constantly. And it's not just the little stuff, it's the most heart-wrenching stuff and it has a negative effect on our psyche and how we're dealing, we're still processing things. Um, they don't want to see just soldiers interacting with kids in Afghanistan and stuff. They want to see somebody running with the kid away from a bomb and stuff like that. It's not always like that. How about showing both sides of the story? So we as a consumer can make our own choices on how things are done. I want to um, ask a broader question because um, you hit upon the media, and then you, you talked about the responsibility of the people of our country. And right now, 
you know, we all know we live in very polarizing times based on race, socioeconomic, um, identity, and the like, region. Um, I, I wonder, after the experience that you've been through, your, your life experience, your life lived, in combat but then outside, you had talked about people of different races and all different regions that you had to depend on. You talked about that family. Then you get out and here's where, here we are. I'm wondering um, what you think, based on your life experience, wh what's the pathway forward? Stop judging, old adage, stop judging a book by its cover. If we go back to treating every individual that comes in our past as a basic human being, we can move better forward. That's it. No matter what race, what sex, orientation, what religion, you're still a basic human being. And if we treat everybody like a human being, we can move forward. You know, I was in captivity and they performed an operation on my legs to clean out the wounds. I don't know if I would have been able to keep my legs if they didn't do that. Was I expecting it? No. But I was shown that kindness. There was a point where I felt uncomfortable with one of the guards who groped me. And then later that night, another guard had slept outside my cell door. I don't know if he saw anything or was, had an inkling, but he slept, slept outside my cell door. He didn't have to do that. Stop judging the book by his cover. I came home and I, I did endure racist taunt, sexist taunt. But I have to say, um, I, I kind of expected the racist taunts. I'm a black woman. I've always been a black woman. Lived one, gonna die as one. It's something I deal with all the time. But it wasn't as much as I thought. I think the sad part for me was the amount of uh, misogyny mm. that I endured. I had more issues with the fact that I was just female. Uh, uh, than the color of my skin. But the basic thing is I'm still a human being. I still deserve the respect as being a human being, plain and simple, plain and simple. And if we look beyond the color of our skin, what name we want to call, call ourselves and, and what God we want to pray to or not pray to, we're human beings. Something so basic, so something, so simple that we have been teaching kindergartners. That that's, a, that's a person and you need to respect them as a person. Yet we grow up and it seems to fly out our heads. You know, I, as you were speaking and you, you spoke of all of the indignities you, you suffered when you came home, like so many other black veterans, particularly being a woman, um, I'm a third generation combat vet. My grandfather was in World War II, Battle of the Bulge. He came home, couldn't get housing, couldn't take advantage of GI Bill, couldn't live in the suburbs because of racism. My father, Korean conflict, came home, had to sit in, you know, Woolworths. He was doing sit-ins, getting taunted. And now your story. But yet there's a commonality here because you still you said at the top of this that you love the military. And you were so optimistic about the possibilities in this country. How do you reconcile? You almost died. You put your life on the line for people that would, in return, say terrible things to you. You're, you're fighting for, for to protect those. Folks. How do you reconcile that? That it will get it will get better for the next generation. The ones that came before me endured more than I did. And they came home and made it better for the next generation. I must, I will, I have endured. God willing, I will make it better for the next generation. To, that's the only way it can go. I hope and pray every day that we will make it to the point where we can look at each other and simply say, you're an American and that's it. That's it. You're an American. We don't have to put the African. We don't have to put the Mexican and all that stuff. Just you're an American. Um, 
we're still working towards that. You know, um, I, it's going to be a long while, but I think we can get there. I think we can get there. What would you say to a younger person, particularly a color woman? You know, 43% of all active duty members are people of color. Um, based on what you experience, what would you say to a black person that's thinking about the military, a black person, black woman that's thinking about the military? I would tell them it's not gonna be easy, but they live their life as a black woman, so they know that. But it can be done. And if it's what you want, if, if it's what you're, you feel that you're meant to do, then go for it. Let no one stand in your way. It is possible. And, you know, the ones that came before us, we stand tall because we stand on the shoulders of women that came before us. And hopefully, my daughter, my nieces, can stand on my shoulders and stand tall. That's, a, that's remarkable. Um, I'm going to, in just a few minutes, open it up to the audience. I, uh, one other question for you. We've got a group of future public policymakers here uh, in the room and watching um, online who inevitably, as I mentioned, will be making decisions in regard to the military influencing of foreign affairs and the like. What do they need to know um, as they begin to think about their role in leadership? First of all, you don't know everything. Be, you know, no matter how far you go in life, you're always learning. Learning doesn't stop. Take information as it comes to you. And I remember, I, I remember it, it, something that happened when we were in Kuwait. We had a specialist, a uh, supply specialist. She was very good at what she did. She ordered parts for the Patriots and things, a bunch of different things. Um, a lieutenant came looking for her from a unit, and he was from like the other side of the camp, heard that she knows how to do this. He came with a pen and paper, and he said, I heard that you know how to get this done. Tell me how to do it. Now, he was a lieutenant. She was a specialist. He wasn't afraid to come to her and find out how to get the thing done for his people. The rank didn't matter. The knowledge of getting the job, in order to get the job done, mattered. Don't assume that because you're a doctor that the paramedic can't give you information that you don't know, that you can't learn from them. If you really think about it, we learn from kids every day and they've only been on the, on the earth this long. Knowledge is always out there, always seek it out and take it from wherever it comes from. And then do as my mom constantly tells me to do, pick the sense out of nonsense. That's the truth, pick the sense out of nonsense. You get the information, you take it in, and what makes sense, you use and go forward. Thank you. So we're gonna open it up, then I ask you one more question as we do this. You can line up at either mic on either side. Um, and the only rule here is that uh, you ask a question. <laughs> um, and please, please identify yourself uh, and, and who you are in the community. W one last, one last uh, question. You had talked about um, your experience coming home, how you had uh, a number of benefits and the like, that, and it's still, you were still challenged. Um, you also told a story in uh, your, your book about how um, the Army really gave you a hard time about recognizing uh, your PTSD and, and you felt that you needed help there. So two things, I, I just wanted you to reflect on that experience and then also just express uh, things that we need to do for veterans um, integrating back into society now. Oh. Well, yeah, I came home um, when I was being medically retired the uh, the army was giving me a, a hard time about 
you know, basically putting on paper that I had PTSD. Uh, it became part of my percentage, you know, but I wanted it written down that I suffered from PTSD. It didn't make a difference. I think people sometimes think that it makes a difference in how much retirement I was gonna get from the Army. It didn't make a difference. But I wanted it written down uh, so it can be acknowledgement of what I went through. Thankfully, things have changed, um, not just because of me, but because uh, Joseph Hudson got a medical retirement after me and they did the same thing, he had to fight. And, and you know, once we raised our voice about it and got some attention, they, they really had to start revamping how they looked at it because we weren't the only ones coming home with this. And quite frankly, it was looking bad for them that the fact that they were fighting us, um, even though they were medicating us, and we made certain appearances and stuff on the, on, in uniform on their behalf. So things did change. I have to say that uh, we had to take a book out of the Vietnam Veterans book uh, uh, playbook. They came home and it was horrible for them, yet they kept fighting and got us vet centers and, and more money for education and mental health and stuff like that. So we kind of followed the playbook and raised our voice anytime we could to make a stink and, and it got things done. Is there still a lot to do? Oh God, yes. Absolutely, there's still so much to do. And I hope that people realize that although we're out of Iraq and Afghanistan, we still have a lot of veterans that have served many tours and are still dealing with a whole lot going on. And just because we're not in an active conflict at the moment, it doesn't mean that men and women aren't putting on a uniform and going to different countries to lend aid when they can and seeing horrific things. It's still happening. We're seeing horrific things. We have, we are spoiled. We're spoiled in this nation. You get into a car accident, you expect the ambulance to come to call 911. That doesn't happen in, in what, well over 50, 60% of the world. There's no ambulance coming. You know, so there's a lot of horrific things you see. And when you come home to this kind of, I don't want to say civilization, but this kind of life, it's a hard adjustment. And that's going to be going on for a lot of years. Okay, thank you for that. Uh, please, we'll start on this side. Uh, thank you. Thank you so much for joining us. Uh, my name is John Cook. I am a freshman at the college studying government. And my question uh, pertains to, you mentioned veteran suicide. Um, veteran suicide has still been on the rise despite VA reform and VA hospital reform being a common talking point among politicians. Um, my question to you is, what is one substantive change that policymakers can make to the VA to actually improve the situation of veterans there. Okay. Okay, Barry White. Um, that voice. <laughs> <laughs> I was like, geez, Louise. <laughs> um, veteran suicide is definitely on the rise. Uh, it's, they need to just quit using it when it's, when it's convenient. These are human lives. These are the same people that you made the decision to send to war. Um, so it shouldn't just be election years that it becomes convenient for you to add money to the, to the, um, the VA's budget. But you gotta follow through. If you give the money and you're still having a rise, you're gonna have to revamp it. You gotta take a deeper look. That's not what they're doing. They're saying, oh, we increased the money and then they walk away without seeing if it's effective, and they're not opening the avenues for alterna alternative care. Not every veteran is gonna respond the same way to certain things. Some people can go ahead and talk and get medication and they'll do fine. Some of them are not gonna do fine. You have to look at different unconventional ways to treat the veteran. And I think they have a problem with opening uh, their minds to that and opening their wallets to that. They want to stick with the medication and the you know talk therapy. It's not going to work all the time. We have so many different avenues, from spiritual counseling, um, 
and then going into culturally appropriate counseling. We have Native Americans and Chinese Americans and Korean Americans, African Americans, Caribbean Americans. Everybody has a different way of dealing with it, sometimes based on their culture. And then the VA and, and those politicians don't want to give in to that kind of thing. Well, if it helps the veteran, isn't that the point? Who the hell cares if you like it? If it does what it's supposed to do, that's, that's the main thing. So they need to open their minds. Did that answer your question? Okay. <laughs> Thank you. I, you know, I always think about the amount of, of money and investment that, that the United States made in training individuals to go into war, um, and myself included, yourself included. If we can figure out how to match that investment when the veterans come home, we'd be thinking about it that way. I think we'd be doing a lot better. Please, hi. Hi, Sadie, how's it going? <laughs> um, it's hard to follow up that voice, but I'm, I'm gonna try. <laughs> um, hi, my name is Grace. Um, I'm a MPP or Master's in Public Policy candidate here at the Kennedy School. Um, I was a US Army veteran. I was an active duty signal officer for four years. Um, so a lot of your, the tidbits, the MRE stories resonates. Um, and I know you told us not to make comments, but I'm just gonna make a quick one. Um, throughout your storytelling, I, I feel like you, you lifted up everyone around you even more so than your own story. Um, and I think it just demonstrates so much generosity um, and you know selflessness in you. So thank you for, for sharing your story um, and lifting up the stories of everyone um, around you. Um, so I, I also really resonate with what you said about um, my sex having more of a say in how people treat me than my, my, uh, my race in the military and post-military. Um, and I, I think that it's, it also has to do a lot with how women were banned from combat um, it, especially during the time that you were literally in combat, literally a, a POW. Um, so I, I wonder for you what it felt like going through that and not sort of receiving, I don't know, that sort of recognition when you came back home or if you recognized um, the magnitude of what you were experiencing as like the first black woman to be a POW. I'm sure that that's not what was going through your mind as you were going through the ordeal. Was there a moment when you came back and you realized the magnitude of what you had experienced and and how other people treated you in that way because being the first also means that you were alone for some time and 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 a pioneer in being the advocate that you are um wow okay that's a lot uh first yeah it was hard especially for when i first came home uh because it, they had this no female in combat so they always make the assumption, oh, you're a veteran, but you were way in the back. No, um, technically I was supposed to be way in the back, but it, that's not how it went. Um, I still get the thing where they, uh, they talk about, oh, all the veterans, and they, they bypass me. They still do it. They still do it, even though we've made strides, even though we've contributed, even though there were certain situations, especially in Afghanistan and Iraq, where females had to be out in front because of how the country is run as far as women and children or ca you know, men can approach them. So it's very frustrating. As far as the uh, first black female POW, I hate it. I hate it with a passion. All it means, since the beginning of this country, people of color have been contributing. Christmas Atticus, y'all, Christmas Atticus, first person of color to die in the Revolutionary World War, right? So we've been contributing in active combat, and I'm the first black female to get caught. All the other black females got out of Dodge, Shauna gets caught. After 200 and what, 250 years close to, I get caught. That's not something to be proud of. You wanna be the first black female president, the first black female on the moon, things like that. You're not the first one to get caught. That's ridiculous. So I hate it, I do, I, I, I survived. I'm very proud to say I am a survivor of a difficult situation. And I will raise my hand and scream it from the rooftop. I survived and I'm damn proud that I did. So that, and 
During the rescue, I was not the first person to cry. <laughs> I held down. I held it down, ladies. I held it down. I was not going to shed a tear. <laughs> the men had to cry first, and they did. Please, go, go ahead. Thank you so much for uh, coming to speak with us today. Uh, my name's Isaac Tang. I'm a uh, first year at the college uh, studying government, and I'm also in the uh, Army ROTC here. And uh, my question, well, I guess the first part is like, yeah, I, I don't know how to phrase it, sorry. <laughs> but um, like, uh, you sp spoke a lot about uh, like the uh, desire and passion to serve and how it's not for everyone, but like nowadays, I'm not sure if it's just me, but it seems like, the desire to serve uh, for a lot of younger Americans, it's not there compared to previous generations. Uh, do you think this is true? Yeah, yeah. I re you know, if you look back at American history, there was a certain prestige associated with being in the military, even for wealthy families. Wealthy families used to petition to have their children go to West Point. They don't do that anymore. You know, it, it's kind of, it's slacked off like, oh, you're going in the military because you don't have anything else. No, it's what I wanted. It's what I love the idea of it. So it's kind of, how do I explain it? The, the respect for the job isn't there as much as it used to be. Just like teachers. Remember when, you know, I don't, I don't know how old some of y'all are. I remember going to school and a teacher called my parents. I was in trouble, you know. Now teachers call the parents and the, t the parents coming up to curse out the teacher. You know, there was a certain amount of respect that was given because this person had educated themselves and were willing to pass on that knowledge to your child. Just like the military, there was a certain amount of respect that was given because they're willing to put on the uniform instead of being uh, um, drafted, but they're willing to put on the uniform and willing to go die for your right to live your life. I think I heard uh, years ago, during World War II, there was a French citizen that said, the American soldier is right up there with God because they're willing to give their life for you, just like God is willing to give their son, his son. Can you, I mean, that's what the American soldier was back then. Now, I don't think it holds as much. I mean. You get your thank you for your service, but sometimes I don't even feel it's sincere. They're saying it just to say it. It doesn't hold the same respect as it used to, unfortunately. But yet they often cry about their freedoms without realizing that it wasn't free. We made sacrifices for it. Did I answer your question? Yes, very much so. Thank okay, you. thank you. <laughs> I just, I, 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 I'm going to take my uh, ability to do this. Why do you think that is? Because what's interesting is that the military or people in the military, as far as how the American people view different institutions, are, they're probably the highest, one of the highest. Uh, they, Congress is very low. Um, different parts of it, our institutions are pretty low. So there's this interesting dichotomy where people aren't joining and there's all the statements that you made and why why do you think why do you think this is I don't know I, th I think our, our priorities have shifted in this country they're, they're rather go on they're rather going to embarrass themselves on TV or on, on in videos than and, and put on a uniform with pride and serve there's nothing wrong with being in the military I every person has their part to play in this world, whether it's a doctor, a preacher, a janitor, a cook, everything can be done with pride. Everything, every job can be done with pride. If you put your best foot forward in your job, then you do it with pride. There is no job in this world that should be looked upon, looked down upon because every job is needed for us to function as a society. And I think we have gone into that I idea that certain jobs are higher than the other. And it's not true. Some people had to work harder to get that particular job than this job, but it still needs to be done. 
you have doctors in the hospital, can they do their job if they don't have the janitors and their surgical techs to clean out all the stuff so they can go into the operating room? And God forbid them people don't do a good job because then somebody's gonna get an infection. Everybody has their part to play. And I think people need to recognize that. It's not the job you do, it's how you do the job. Thank you. Thank you, my name is Rose O'Brien and I'm a master's in public policy here at the Kennedy School. I was very touched how you mentioned the humanity of the people who, were, who captured you, as well as the common experiences you shared with different veterans and POWs from different conflicts. And I'm curious to know, have you had the opportunity to sit down and talk with anybody who's been detained or who's been a POW captured by the United States in Iraq or Afghanistan? No, I have not. I never even, it, I don't even know how you would uh, contact any of them. I mean, being that I don't know that any of them are in the U.S. And Lord knows I'm not going to Iraq. <laughs> <laughs> I, I mean, I admire those guys from Vietnam that, you know, after years later, they've gone back to Vietnam after being in captivity and fighting that war and stuff like that. Yeah, I don't, yeah, yeah. I, I don't know. I don't know if I'm ever going to be in that place. God bless them. They're very, and that shows you how you can overcome something and open your heart and look in a different way. I'm not there yet. Uh, I'm not there yet. Thank you, Brian. Thank you so much for coming to speak to us. Uh, I'm Ryan Tierney. I'm a sophomore at the college. Uh, you mentioned that uh, the United States were kind of winding down our role in the Middle East, but still, especially in Europe, as we've been mm. seeing, there's been a, uh, increased tensions and military buildup there, uh, both U.S. troops going there, Russia building up, and it seems to be uh, that we could be on the verge of another conflict, whether that involve U.S. troops directly or that involve troops of, of foreign militaries. Uh, and ultimately, the decision uh, to enter that conflict or not to enter that conflict lies in the hands of political leaders. What would you say to the political leaders, uh, whether it be Vladimir Putin uh, or uh, President Joe Biden, who, who hold the cards in the situation that's playing out in the Ukraine? Uh, what, would, what would you say to them to... Um, you know, offer your perspective on whether or not we should enter a conflict? Um, first of all, I hope and pray it doesn't go that far. To Vladimir Putin, I would say Ukraine has a right to be Ukraine. These people have their country. You have no right to step in. Just like no other country has a right to go into Russia. I don't, I don't, <laughs> he talks about what it used to be as far as the Soviet Union and stuff like that. The Soviet Union is no more, let it go. Ukraine has a right to be Ukraine and God bless those people because they're ready to fight to stay Ukraine. Um, to Joe Biden, I would say, be careful. We, we, as the United States, have a right to support democracy the best we can, but this is touchy. And it's not just about supporting democracy, it's about how much we as American people can take. We, we haven't really recovered from the two conflicts that we just ended, you know, so tread lightly, um, but you know, I, I think that we have a right to uh, support uh, democracy um, the best we can in what ways we can, but I, I really don't wanna see um, us going too far into this. We just have to really tread lightly. It, wor it, it does worry me immensely, it worries me immensely. Thanks. Hi, thanks so much for being with us today. Uh, my name is Jack. I'm a first year at the college studying government. Um, you mentioned how the US isn't involved anymore in a, a full scale war. Um, and with the winding down of the wars in Iraq and Afghanistan, it feels like a persistent political talking point on Capitol Hill has been potentially cutting the military's budget or rethinking the allocation of money to different branches of the military. How do you look at that debate with everything that you've experienced um, in the military and with the VA 
and with what you've talked about with mental health resources for veterans? Um, I would need to look deeper at the allocations. They like to devote so much money to the technology without devoting enough money to the people. Um, there has been so many different issues uh, from military bases where the housing was substandard and there's mold and people are getting sick to not enough money to take care of the families who are dealing with the, um, the, the uh, soldiers being away and coming back. I don't have I don't think the American people will have a problem with the defense budget being as large as long as the money is going where it needs to be going. Uh, too much is going to, uh, um, yeah, the massive weapons, and I'm gonna tell you, some of them weapons are not the greatest. Uh, my M16 jammed, and people always take, oh, you didn't clean your weapon. I clean my weapon. The M16 is known to jam. Basic training, they teach you that the M16 will be jam. They teach you how to perform sports. Slap, pull, uh, what is it, Obst what is it? obstruction, observe, see? They teach you that in basic training that the M16 will jam. <laughs> Yet, they haven't replaced it. How does that make sense? We need to watch how the money is allocated. Don't just assume that it's a big budget and it's gonna go where it needed. No, it's not. We, and we, as the people in this country, need to pay closer attention and do more research. We have so much knowledge at the, our fingertips if we, are taking, if we are willing to take the time and go through it carefully and um, make our voices be heard. Uh, these people that sit in the legislature work for us. I think that needs to be told to them time and time again, and it needs to be told to the, the American people. They have a boss. It's us. It was a, a government for the people, by the people. These people need to realize that. I think that's one of the things we, we as, a, as a nation, need to rethink. Our legislature kind of governs themselves a little too much. We need to step in. They give themselves a pay raise. They see what they control what kind of benefits they get and all that kind of stuff. Um, we're the boss. We should be deciding that, not them. Did that answer your question? Where'd he go? <laughs> okay, okay. <laughs> I think we have another question. Here. Yes, ma'am. Yeah. Uh, thank you so much for coming here. Uh, my name is Liza. I'm a graduate student here at, at Kennedy School. And uh, not from the United States, I'm, I'm from Denmark. Um, so I guess one of the things I both noticed in your story, but also as we've been looking at the US military and, and the, the welfare system that the US military uh, creates internally, I, I'd just love to hear your perspectives on the pull effect the military had when you said it's an opportunity to pay for college how expanding the military and the wealth and the support system also attracts people who come from more disadvantaged backgrounds and uh, with, a, with a huge skew to um, non-white Americans into, into the public service and whether you think there are any drawbacks of expanding, you say, the welfare system of the military at the cost of um, not building it out other places. Does that make sense? Let me do it in a short version. Okay. <laughs> the US military pays for health care for college. For many, it seems like it's the one opportunity to actually access a welfare system. And I was just wondering, a lot of your comments were around uh, what it looks like to build out the, the US welfare system in terms of mental care, veteran services, but uh, whether you in any way are worried about you know, how when the military becomes the only feasible welfare system really uh, for young people in the United States. And again, this comes from an extremely privileged position in Denmark, which has an expansive universal welfare system. Okay, I see what you're saying. Like the, the military would be the only way to go advance your education and get that healthcare and stuff like that. Yeah, it's kind of scary. Um, it shouldn't be that I have to join the military in order to get 
further my education. It, it should be, that's an opportunity I can take advantage of. It can't be the only way. Um, that is a little bit worrisome because um, if you don't have the heart for it, you know, it becomes a drain. It takes thousands, hundreds of thousands of dollars to train, you know, somebody in the military. Um, you hopefully they're doing it for the right reasons, but it also is kind of, that shouldn't be the only way to get it done, you know? So we need to look, it goes back to, you know, us being able to uh, uh, govern our politicians. So there's other opportunities um, that our young people have different avenues and which one is best for them, not the only one. So um, it is a worry, but if we take care of the other stuff, like being on our politicians, so there's different ways to go and further your education and, and stuff like that, it should be a secondary worry to, uh, to those things. Because I, I, I'm, I'm terrified of um, our education system and our um, medical system after this COVID crisis. We lost so many doctors and nurses and stuff. I don't know, and we're not putting them back into the system the way we were because the cost of education is so much, um, you know. So it's gonna get to a point, and I see it already because there's many rural hospitals and healthcare clinics that are shutting down, and only people of means are gonna have avenues for healthcare because the people who are providing that healthcare has spent so much money going to school, they're gonna have to follow the money in order to pay back all the student loans. So that means the poorer people aren't gonna have the access because there's not enough doctors and nurses out there. And now we're seeing a shortage of teachers because you know, they're worried about their health and you know, all these threats that they're getting and stuff like that. So you're not gonna have enough teachers for the rural areas, the low income communities, and they're, gonna be, you know, they're not gonna be able to further their education. This is a big old circle that we have to work on. It seems sometimes that we're taking two steps back instead of one, one and two and three steps forward. Well, Shoshana, we're coming up on time. And oh. as we wrap up, I was reflecting upon what you said a little earlier, which is you really have built your inspiration off of others that came before you. And I think, I feel confident in saying like so many veterans that have returned home made a difference in people's lives. You are someone that we are all going to be inspired by and hopefully use your strength and your actions to produce a better country and a better world. We are inspired by you. We're honored that you're here. Thank you so much. Thank you. I do have a message um, for our next forum, which happens to be tomorrow at 4 p.m. Uh, the forum is entitled Reparations for Black Americans, Radical or Routine? Professor Linda Belmez and Professor Cornell William Brooks will be presenting their groundbreaking study in a discussion moderated by Deborah D. Douglas, co-editor-in-chief of The Emancipator. Registration is still open. We'd love to see you there. Thank you again and have a good night. Thank you.